Well, it's been a long time since this old Mustang and I thundered down the strip together. I'm Doc Watson, president of the American Fighter Ace Association. We're made up of aces of all services and all wars. You're about to see a remarkable demonstration of patriotism, courage, and airmanship displayed by Americans in World War II. We believe the film epitomizes the principles Americans stand for and which our armed forces today proudly carry on. Aircraft and tactics have changed and will continue to change. But patriotism, courage, and skill, the vital qualities displayed by our pilots in this film will always be needed. The American Fighter Aces Association is proud to endorse this film, and it is our hope that the following scenes will help to keep alive the spirit that inspired us and thousands like us to seize the initiative in the air and join and triumph in our fight for the sky. American fighter planes based in England, operating in the skies of Western Europe against the German Air Force. This is the P-47, the Thunderbolt, a fast, tough, high-altitude fighter with a dive like its name and an eight-gun blast in its wings. Here is the Lightning, the P-38, master of the air in many theaters of war. The long-range and concentrated firepower of this great fighter counted in Western Europe, too. The Mustang, the P-51, longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. A fighter pilot's dream. Into these three great fighters, America poured its genius. It's millions of man hours of labor. It's faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed its carefully chosen sons, trained to a fighting edge, trained as never before. Here is their report, catch as catch could, by their own gun cameras in the instant of action, and delivered in return for your oil and your treasure and your high hopes. This is a Thunderbolt base in East Anglia on the east coast of England. One of many such bases from which our fighter planes swarmed up into the far red yonder of battle to the east. Their main job, although they struck many other blows, was to escort and protect our heavy four-engine bombers, the big friends, against the Fock Wolf 190s, the ME 109s, and the enemy's rocket lobbing twin engines, JU 88s, ME 210s, 410s, and others to attack them whenever, wherever, and in whatever strength they appear. Our direct challenge for control of the air. Trucks bring the pilots from the field to the squadron dispersal hut for intelligence interrogation after the mission. Coffee and sandwiches if they want it. Little action today, just a routine escort. You saw four 190s on the field. That's right. Harry saw him, too. I think it was this field, Jack, farther west. We made the 180 here and flew about two minutes on 340. Well, that's about 15 miles south of Hanover. We thought that field was knocked out. They seem like ordinary American boys. But look a little closer. Now they pile in a jeep and ride to chop. They have jeeps enough, but they like it this way. They kid a lot, high-spirited. And later they relax and enjoy the not-too-frequent sunlight. Unless some joker is present, and he usually is. They keep pretty fit, ready to stand anything up to seven hours in a single seater in substratosphere, alert every second. And they keep their eye in. This fellow has 22 destroyed. Well, he may have if he keeps at it. And they won't be clay pigeons.
The old swim and hole is the same in England as at home. They had a beautiful summer in England that day. Little aquatic practice won't hurt either. They may have to make a high dive with chute and become a channel swimmer almost any time. Of course, it gives their airborne pals a fine chance to practice low flying a bit. The swimmers take no chances on this buzz job. Maybe they're learning not to get behind the eight ball here. Put the six in the corner. Getting in shape for Wimbledon in a small way. Good shot. Keep your eye on the little white ball, Eddie. Keeping up with their crooning, naturally. May need that in the good old by and by. Everybody's favorite newspaper in this town. What goes on in New Guinea, China, and Luzon? What's happening at home? Best of all is their comradeship. Fellows who are trusting one another with their lives in this teamwork war learn to be friends. Somewhere else in England, and another day, from deep sweeps into enemy territory, a weather reconnaissance plane flies in. Its reports are cross-checked with many others writing the destiny of today or tomorrow in atmospheric pressure lines. Fair in this theater means not impossible, and weather is almost enemy number one. At 8th Air Force, General Doolittle discusses fighter protection. The 8th Fighter Command will give fighter cover to targets and back from the targets. Desirable that we peel off as many fighters as possible to come down east of the Ruhr and straight ground targets. How many do you want to peel off? Well, General, we're spreading over a pretty wide area there. Uh, I'd recommend very seriously that we hold uh, all strafing to a minimum. All right. Go ahead and send that over to the 8th Fighter Command. Yes, sir. The bomber plan, timing, altitudes, forces, course, and targets have reached the combat operations room at headquarters 8th Fighter Command. Major General Kepner commanding. Now the general and his chief of staff, Brigadier General Griswold, come in to inspect and discuss the plan of escort. Colonel Burns' operations determines what group shall fly. Colonel James decides their disposition. Colonel Callahan, intelligence, estimates where and when the enemy will intercept. It's an intricate scientific plan, based upon information from many sources and upon the route and location of the target. Then a field order goes out to the fighter wings and through them to the fighter groups and squadrons which they control. This command supports 1st and 2nd bomber forces. 62nd Group P-47s will escort heavy bombers over enemy coast through target to limit of endurance. All observations will be reported over RT. The field order is received at the fighter base by the duty officer in group operations. He checks the field order for the group rendezvous time with the bombers. He calls maintenance, armament, and others. And in the still dark hours of the morning, a squadron intelligence officer shakes the pilots out of their deep sleep. Briefing at 6.30. Oh, um, why can't they fight the war at a reasonable hour? 